comes to the topic of good and evil, there are many people in the world today who are convinced that you can't have one without the other. As a matter of fact, I went to Yahoo Answers the other day and I found a page where the question was posed, can you have good without evil? Well, in response to this question, one blogger who calls himself the dude insisted that good is meaningless without evil. So is the other way around. Another blogger named Eric, he echoed the same sentiment by writing, nothing exists without its opposite. And yet, still another blogger who goes by the name of Amp agreed by declaring, without evil, there would be no concept of good. Everything needs its opposite in order to exist as a concept. Day needs night, male needs female, yin and yang, etc., now, as we consider this third response, it'll help us to understand that yin and yang, this is an Eastern concept in which good and evil must continually exist in equal amounts. And if you follow this philosophy to the ultimate end, then you're left with a confusing question about good and evil. Think about it. If good and evil are always found to exist in equal amounts, then the person who sets out to do the most amount of good in the world today is simultaneously forcing the universe to produce more evil in order to balance out the good that was created. Not only that, but in a universe that is ruled by the principle of yin and yang, the person who commits the most evil acts that they can imagine, well, they end up causing more good to happen as the universe begins to balance itself out. And so if good and evil must exist in equal amounts, then the best thing that any of us could do is nothing. That's the best that we could do. Nothing. And the reason why is because those who set out to do good in this world will only end up creating more evil. And therefore, we must then engage in evil acts in order to accomplish the good that we truly desire. From this, it should be clear that every reasonable person should come to the conclusion that the concept of yin and yang is without question oxymoronic, with an emphasis on moronic. Not only that, but the belief that evil must exist in order to identify good, well, it's based on a common misconception. This common misconception is rooted in the belief that good would be unrecognizable without the contrast of evil. However, we must understand that evil isn't something that exists, but instead, it's the degradation of the good that does exist. You see, God created things, and they were very good. Evil is the degradation of those good things. Therefore, it's not only possible for good to exist without evil, but the God who is good has also promised to help us to prevail over evil each and every day. Well, here in our study this morning, we're going to consider how the Lord has a plan to give us the power to prevail over evil. And as we get into our text today, we're going to see, number one, how God gives us the power to prevail over evil by filling us with faith. Secondly, we'll see that God gives us the power to prevail over evil by guarding our steps. And finally, we'll see today that God gives us the power to prevail over evil by delivering our life. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 26, where we find God giving David the power to prevail over Saul and his 3,000 soldiers. As you turn to 1 Samuel 26, I want to set the stage for our study today. And I want to remind you about the way in which David had been on the run for quite some time, simply because Saul, who at this point in time, he was the king of Israel, and he was seeking to capture, and he was seeking to kill David. And though Saul had recently promised David that he would stop trying to hunt him and kill him, here in our text today, we actually see Saul breaking his promise once again. And so with all this background in mind, let's look at our text. I want to begin reading there at 1 Samuel 26, verse 1. There we read that the Ziphites came to Saul and Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hakilah, opposite Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. 
And Saul encamped in the hill of Hakala, which is opposite of Jeshimon by the road. But David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul had indeed come. So David arose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Now Saul lay within the camp with the people encamped all around him. Then David answered and said to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and there Saul lay sleeping within the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hands this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him once with the spear right into the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, Furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his days shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head, and they got away, and no man saw or knew it or awoke, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Now David went over to the other side and stood on the top of a hill afar off, a great distance being between them. And David called out to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Do you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who are you? Calling out to the king. So David said to Abner, Are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy your lord, the king. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die, because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is, and the jug of water that was by his head. Then Saul knew David's voice and said, Is that your voice, my son David? David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Why does my lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done, or what evil? Is in my hand. Now, therefore, please let my Lord the King hear the words of his servants. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. So now, do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, for the King of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will not harm you, for I will harm you no more, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Here's the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. Well, here in our text today, we find Saul once again seeking the life of David. And yet at the end of the day, after all was said and done, Saul was forced to confess that God was giving David the power to prevail over him. Notice again there at verse 26. There Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. Now, it'll help us to know that this word prevail comes from a Hebrew word which refers to the power to overcome and be victorious over every enemy. And as we consider the meaning of this word, there should be no doubt that in our minds that that, that God was the one who was giving David the power to prevail over Saul's evil schemes. And so with this as our focus, let's consider how God gave David the power to prevail over evil by first filling him with the faith to believe that the Lord was there to fight his battles for him. Now with this in mind, let's look again beginning at the beginning of this chapter where we find the Ziphites, they're alerting Saul to David's whereabouts. Notice again there at verse 1. There we learn that the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah saying, is David not hiding in the hill of Hakala opposite Jeshimon? 
Now, here in this verse, we learn that David was no longer living in the wilderness of Paran as he had been, but instead, he and his men had moved north to the wilderness of Ziph, which was located in the land of Judah. And at that point in time, the inhabitants of Ziph, they decided to go and tell Saul that David was actually living there in their land. Now, as we read about the way that these Ziphites were attempting to stir up Saul against David, I should remind you that this wasn't the first time that these Israelites had encouraged Saul to come and kill David. As a matter of fact, Hold your place there at 1 Samuel 26, and let's turn back three chapters to 1 Samuel 23. You see it's in 1 Samuel 23 that we find this same exact scenario playing out for the very first time. With this in mind, look with me there at verse 19. There we learn that the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding with us in strongholds in the woods in the hill of Hakalah? which is on the south of Jeshimon. Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. Now here in these verses we find David, he's hiding in the land of Ziph for the very first time. And I'll remind you that the Ziphites, they were Israelites from the tribe of Judah, just like David was. They were all from the tribe of Judah, but rather than supporting their fellow tribesmen, they instead encouraged Saul to come and kill him. Now you might be wondering here, with this background in mind, why in the world would David return to this area knowing that this whole area was inhabited by haters? They were David haters. Didn't he know that these people were just going to turn on him again? Didn't he understand that if he returned to the land of Ziph, that the Ziphites would run off and tell Saul just once again that David was in their land? Well, if I had to guess, then yes. I don't think David was a big dummy who was clueless to this fact. I think that David knew that this is exactly what they would do, and one reason why is because the last time that he stayed in the wilderness of Ziph, he ended up fearfully running away from Saul. In so doing, David had demonstrated before a lack of faith in God by running away. But now, after having watched the Lord protect him from Saul time and time again, and after seeing how the Lord had defended the cause of his reproach from the hand of Nabal, David also knew that the Lord was going to come to his rescue there in the land of Ziph. And not only did he finally have the faith to believe in God's ability to fight all of his battles for him, but I'm guessing he wanted the Ziphites to know. I think before he ran away and the Ziphites said, see, he's guilty, he's running. And I think the Lord is leading David back to the land of Ziph so that the Lord can say, no, he's not guilty. As a matter of fact, I'm going to bring him back into your land and I'm going to defend him in front of you so that you can see that there is no evil in David. So it's possible that the Lord was leading David to return to the wilderness of Ziph so that the Ziphites could see how God was giving David the power to prevail over evil. And as David made himself at home there in the wilderness of Ziph, Saul was getting ready to capture David. As a matter of fact, notice again there at verse 2. There we learn that Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. Now, here in this verse, we find Saul traveling with 3,000 soldiers. And as we consider the sight of 3,000 soldiers traveling through the land, you better believe that the news of Saul's campaign was traveling faster than he was. I'm sure that the news of of these 3,000 guys heading to Ziph, uh, that news traveled and, and, and caught up with David before Saul actually got there. And as Saul began to set up his camp on the hill of Hakalah, David already knew that Saul and his men were in the area. With this in mind, look with me there at verse 3, where we learn that Saul encamped in the hill of Hakala, which is opposite of Jeshimon, by the road. But David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. From this, we see that David knew about Saul's arrival there in the land of Ziph. And you might think that David and his men would have fearfully uh, run away after realizing that they were largely outnumbered. It was 3,000 men to 600. And yet, rather than running away, David decided that he was going to act upon his faith in God's ability to fight and win this battle for him. As a matter of fact, David decided that he was not only not going to run, but he was actually going to infiltrate Saul's massive camp. And the first thing that he did was he sent out spies in order to discover the exact location of Saul's camp. Now, with this in mind, look with me there at verse 4. There we learn that David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul had indeed come. 
Now from this, we see that David, he sent out several squads of men in order to locate the exact position of Saul's camp. And then after acquiring this intel, David prepared to sneak into Saul's camp. Look with me there at verse 5. There we learn that David arose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Now Saul lay within the camp with the people encamped all around him. Then David answered and said to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Abishai the son of Zeruiah, the brother of Joab, saying, who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. In other words, Ahimelech was like saying, I'm not going with you, you're crazy. But Abishai was like, I'm all for this, let's go. And we find David here and this man named Abishai, they're infiltrating Saul's camp. And though the king was surrounded by 3,000 choice soldiers, Saul would soon discover that 3,000 sleeping soldiers weren't able to protect him from David. With this in mind, look with me there, beginning at verse 7. There we learn that David and Abishai came to the people by night, and there Saul lay sleeping within the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head, and Abner and the people lay all around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord placing Saul's life into the hands of David yet once again. Remember, the first time was when Saul stopped to use the restroom in a cave where David and his men were actually hiding. And while David had been given the opportunity to kill Saul, he actually ended up sparing Saul's life. Now here he is again, yet with another opportunity to kill the king of Israel and to take the throne for himself. However, David knew that they didn't need to engage in this act of evil to take Saul's life in order to take the throne because he knew that the Lord was going to deal with Saul in his own way and in his own timing. As a matter of fact, notice again there at verse nine. There we learn that David said to Abishai, do not destroy him for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. Now from this we see that David recognized the importance of allowing God <laughs> to remove the king from his position. God had anointed him, and God was the one who could take him out of this position. Therefore, rather than allowing Abishai to carry out this evil scheme to murder the king, David encouraged him to keep his hands clean so that he could be considered guiltless in this matter. And there in verse 10, David spoke those faith-filled words by declaring, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. Here in these verses, we find David helping Abishai to see how the Lord was able to take care of Saul. The Lord had his number. The Lord was going to bring him to account. And regardless of how the Lord was going to do it, David knew there was coming a day when the Lord would bring Saul's evil rule to an end. So we see then that God was giving David the power to prevail over evil by filling his heart with the faith to believe that God was able to remove Saul, but in a way that would be righteous, not in a way that would be evil, not in a way that would be murderous, but in a way that would be in line with the righteousness of God. And as we examine David's example here, we should take a moment to consider how the Lord also wants to fill our hearts with the same sort of faith so that we too can have the power to prevail over evil. Now with this in mind, if you would hold your place there at 1 Samuel and turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. As you turn to 1 John 5, I should point out that while David's problems are very different from our problems, the fact still remains that we all have a spiritual enemy who is attempting to destroy our lives with evil schemes. The devil comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. And there's no doubt in my mind that the enemy of our soul is attempting to destroy our lives in some way. And it's possible that like David, You've been given the opportunity to overcome some sort of evil in your life by engaging in an evil act. It's possible that you've been given an opportunity to do something wrong to overcome something that's wrong. 
However, we must understand that God hasn't called us to overcome evil with evil. But instead, he's called us to overcome evil with good. And in order to do this, believer, we must walk by faith. This is exactly what the Apostle John was talking about here in 1 John chapter 5. If you would look with me beginning at verse 4. There John assures us that whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Here in these verses, John helps us to see that it's our faith that will help us to overcome the evil in this world. It's not by engaging in evil that we overcome evil but rather it's by walking in faith that we overcome evil. But yet we must understand that it's not the faith itself that gives us the victory, but instead it's the object of our faith. It's unfortunate that in this day and age there are many Christians who completely get this all mixed up. They're confused about this concept. They've been taught to have faith in their faith. And so there's all these Christians that are walking around just with lots of faith in their faith. And they believe a whole lot of things about what they think God is going to do for them. And they've got all this faith wrapped up into their faith. But God hasn't called us to place faith in faith. The Christian who's placing faith in their faith has the wrong object of faith. And that's what's important here. It's not the faith it's not having this great amount of faith that we can just believe that God is going to do all these things that he never even promised that he would do. That's not where our faith belongs. The question is, what is the object of your faith? Please understand that the power to prevail over evil isn't based on the amount of faith that we have, but instead our faith that provides us with the power to prevail over evil has everything to do with the object of our faith. And the object of our faith must be Jesus Christ. Our faith must be in the Lord who is all-powerful and with his good is able to overcome every form of evil. Therefore, we must not have faith in faith, but instead we must place our faith in the one who has the power to prevail over every form of evil. And as we do, well, the Lord gives us the power to prevail, which fills our hearts with the faith that we need to finish the fight. When we place our faith in, in the Lord, who has all power, all of a sudden we're given more faith because we see him securing the victory for us time and time again. He, he secures the victory for us in smaller skirmishes and so that when the big battle comes, we can know, oh wait, he helped me win here, here, and here, and so I can better believe that he's gonna help me win here too. And so the object of our faith must be Jesus Christ. And in this way, God gives us the power to prevail over evil by filling our hearts with faith in the Lord's ability to fight those battles for us. Not only that, though, but God also gives us the power to prevail over evil by guarding our steps as we move forward. Now, with this as our focus, let's turn back to 1 Samuel 26, where we find the Lord guarding the steps of David. If you would, look with me beginning at verse 11. There David declares, the Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head and they got away and no man saw or knew it or awoke for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Now, here in these verses, we find David and Abishai. They're standing there in the middle of King Saul's camp discussing their options about what they ought to do now that they had found the king. They're standing there right over his bed, and they're arguing about what they should do here. And as we consider this scene, we must remember that Saul wasn't alone. He was actually there with 3,000 choice men. And there at the end of verse 5, we're told that Saul lay within the camp with the people encamped all around him. Now from this, we see that David and Abishai had not only entered into this camp that was filled by 3,000 soldiers, but these guys snuck their way to the very center of this camp where Saul was found soundly asleep. So there's Saul, and they had just snuck past several thousand soldiers. Now imagine yourself. Put yourself in this place here, creeping through a camp filled with 3,000 sleeping soldiers who were all sent to capture you. 
And in order to find Saul, you would need to step over hundreds of huge, burly men, all of whom would be happy to wake up and catch you sneaking right over them. Without a doubt, you would need help from God to guard your steps so that you could accomplish your mission. And thankfully for David and Abishai, God was guarding their every step so that they would have the power to prevail over Saul's evil plan. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 12 where we learn that David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head and they got away and no man saw or knew it or awoke. Why? For they were all asleep. Because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Here in this verse, we learn that David and Abishai were able to sneak in and out of Saul's camp without being seen or heard by 3,000 men who were there to guard the king. And the reason why is because the Lord had caused a deep sleep to fall on all of these soldiers. And in this way, God was helping them to prevail over evil. And he did this by guarding their steps. Unfortunately for Saul, the same wasn't true for him. Now with this in mind, look with me there at 1 Samuel 26, beginning at verse 13. There we learn that David went over to the other side and stood on the top of a hill afar off, a great distance being between them. And David called out to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Do you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who are you calling out to the king? So David said to Abner, Are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your lord the king? For one of the people came in to destroy your Lord the king. This thing you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jug of water that was by his head. Now here in these verses, we find David, he's putting some distance between himself and the camp of Saul after taking Saul's spear. And then after arriving at a strategic position, David called out to the captain of Saul's army. He aroused him from his sleep, and he, and he began to challenge this man named Abner, and he began to point out his complete inability to guard the king. Notice again at verse 15, David said to Abner, are you not a man? Ouch. I mean, come on. You were given one job to do. You couldn't do it. He asks, why then have you not guarded your Lord the king? If you're a man, Abner, Why couldn't you accomplish your mission? And he tells him, for one of the people, that being David, came in to destroy your Lord the King. In other words, David was challenging Abner's ability to properly guard the king, and as a result, David was suggesting that Abner actually deserved to die. He's saying, hey, you let someone come in past you and past all your men, and and you allowed the king's life to, to be put at risk. You don't deserve that position. You don't even deserve to live. That's what David's saying. Then after challenging Abner's ability to guard the king, David revealed the evidence of Abner's failure. And if you would look with me there at verse 16, where David declares, this thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not guarded your master. The Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is in the jug of water that was by his head. Now here in this verse, David encouraged Abner to go and look for the spear and the jug of water that had been placed right there by Saul's head, and as Abner went and found this spear and, and this water jug missing from the place where Saul was laying, he and the rest of Saul's soldiers realized that they had failed to guard the king. It's not just David calling out from another hillside saying, you know, we thought about sneaking in, but no, we snuck in and took these items from right beside the head of your king. Not only that, but David was also showing Saul that he wasn't safe even in the midst of 3,000 soldiers. And furthermore, David was also helping Saul to see that his life had been spared once again. That God had given Saul into the hands of David. That David spared his life. Now as we consider this story, we find this interesting contrast between the protection that's being provided by 3,000 soldiers and the protection that was provided by the Lord. And in light of these events, we can see how God did a much better job guarding David than the 3,000 soldiers could do guarding King Saul. And from this, we see then that the Lord provided David with the power to prevail over Saul's evil scheme by guarding his steps there in the camp of the enemy. 
And as we consider the protection that the Lord provided David, we should take some time to consider the way in which the Lord also wants to help us to prevail over evil by guarding our steps. And so if you would, hold your place there at 1 Samuel and turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. As you turn to 2 Thessalonians 3, we should take a moment to consider the increase of power that comes from protection. For example, the most powerful soldier in the world still recognizes that he can be stopped by a single small bullet. (laughs) One single small bullet can bring the most powerful soldier in the world down. As a result, the, the, this powerful soldier who lacks the protection of a bulletproof vest or, or a helmet, that powerful soldier will have less confidence to act upon their power than a weaker soldier who's fully equipped with all of the protective battle gear. The weaker soldier with all the protective battle gear will end up demonstrating more power because they feel safer with that protective gear on. And it's in similar fashion that the Christian who is walking in the spiritual protection of the Lord will enjoy the power to prevail over evil because we have the confidence in knowing that the Lord is the one who's actually guarding us. Now with this in mind, if you would look with me there at 2 Thessalonians 3, I want to begin at verse 1. There Paul writes, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Here in these verses, we find Paul asking the Christians in Thessalonica to pray for him so that he and his traveling companions could be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. And from this, we see that Paul knew that he needed protection from the Lord in order to prevail over evil. But not only that, there at the end of verse 3, Paul also took a moment to assure those same Christians that he was asking for prayer from. He assures them by telling them that the Lord is faithful who will establish them and guard them from the evil one. Or in other words, The Lord was promising to help them prevail against evil by guarding their steps. I'm here to tell you, the same thing is true for us. The same thing is true for every Christian here this morning. Every believer who will walk in the will of the Lord can rest assured that the Lord is guarding them. You see, whenever we commit ourselves to walking in the will of the Lord, the will that's defined in his word, what we end up gaining is the confidence in knowing that the Lord is guarding our every step. He's guarding us from the evil one. And here in this world, it's like we're right there in in, in the midst of Saul's camp and we're stepping over big burly soldiers who have been sent out to destroy us. And we can tremble and, and, and we can worry about it and we can think any moment now, you know, the enemy's gonna wake up and catch us creeping. And we're done for. And I would say, what are you worried about? The Lord knows how to cast a deep sleep over them. The Lord knows how to guard us. He's able and willing. He wants to give us the power to prevail over evil by helping us understand that he's the one protecting us. And so we don't have to worry about it. We can sneak into the camp and sneak back out and never suffer the, uh, the effects of evil that, that, that the enemy wants to bring on us. With this confidence, we can move forward in faith with the power to prevail, knowing that the Lord is the one who is protecting us. The all-powerful creator of the universe is the one who is guarding our steps so long as we walk in his will. So we see then that God gives us the power to prevail over evil by filling our hearts with faith as we Walk by faith in the God who is all-powerful. We're giving the power to to prevail over evil with that faith, and and then that helps us to move forward and take those steps that the Lord is going to guard. The Lord's going to guard those steps and give us power to prevail over evil. As God provides us with perfect protection from the evil one, we can move forward with Christ-centered confidence, knowing that the gates of hell can't prevail against us. Well, finally, we should consider how God also gives us the power to prevail over evil by delivering our life. And so with this as our focus, let's turn back to 1 Samuel 26. I want to consider 
the deliverance of David. With this in mind, if you would, look with me there at verse 17. There we read that Saul knew David's voice and said, Is that your voice, my son David? David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Why does my lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in my hand? David was saying, I haven't, I haven't done anything evil against you. Why are you trying to do evil against me? Now, therefore, please let my lord, the king, hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. So now do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will not harm you, for I will harm you no more, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Here is the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, may you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. Now, here in these verses, we find David declaring his innocence to King Saul. He's saying, hey, I haven't done anything evil to you. I have no evil intentions here. And he went on to prove his innocence by pointing out that the Lord had delivered Saul into his hands. He says, hey, God delivered you into my hands, not the other way around. And while he could have taken the king's life there in the middle of the night, he didn't. And instead, he allowed Saul to live because he knew that he didn't need to engage in an act of evil in order to escape the evil schemes of Saul. And rather than taking his deliverance by force, David allowed the Lord to deliver him from Saul. Notice again, there at verse 24. David said to Saul, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Now here in this verse, we find David asking Saul to repay him with the same <coughs> kindness that he had been shown. But remember, the Lord had given David... a the opportunity to take Saul's life, but rather than fighting evil with evil, David trusted the Lord's ability to deliver him from evil by giving him the power to prevail over evil. As a matter of fact, notice again there at verse 24. David acknowledges that his deliverance was coming from the Lord. He wasn't saying, hey, Saul, will you deliver me? He's saying, hey, Saul, the Lord already delivered me. David acknowledged that his deliverance was coming from the Lord by declaring, and let him, that is, let God, let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Now, I should point out that the word deliver there, it comes from a Hebrew word which speaks of rescuing someone from enemies or trouble or death. And so David knew that the Lord was going to give him the power to prevail over evil by delivering his life from Saul. And from this example, we too should remember always that the Lord has a plan to do the same for us. Now with this in mind, if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter six, because it's in Matthew six that we find Jesus. He's actually teaching his disciples how to pray. And here in this prayer, Jesus helps us to see how every believer ought to be asking the Lord for the power to prevail over evil. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me there at Matthew chapter six, I wanna begin reading there at verse 13. There Jesus declares, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now as we consider the way in which this model prayer ends, we can see that the Lord wants us to prayerfully seek heavenly help from God so that we can have God's power to prevail over the evil one. And listen, Peter assures us in his second epistle that the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. 
Therefore, the Christian who truly wants to be delivered from the sinful schemes of the evil one, we ought to be spending time in prayer so that we can have the power to prevail over evil. And it's sad to say that Christians, time and time again, wake up and they go on about their day without ever spending any time in prayer, and then the next thing they know, they're faced with an evil temptation, or they find someone with a sinful scheme against them, and they don't know what to do about it, and they don't have any power to deal with it. And the reason why is because they never spent any time that day praying for the power to prevail over the evil one. And then they wonder, well, God, where were you? Where was God when the evil trial was happening in my life? <laughs> where were you? And <laughs> you should have been spending time praying and asking for that power. That's the real question. God does, doesn't move. And so if you're not close to God, who moved? Because it wasn't God. You must understand that the power to prevail over evil is given to the believer who will spend time in the presence of the Lord, praying and asking God to deliver them from the evil one. Therefore, let's spend time praying. And let's ask the Lord each and every day, Lord, before I leave this house today, give me the power to prevail. Now, as we consider this ongoing struggle between good and evil, it has been said that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. I mean, if the enemy can just get you to do nothing, he's won. If the enemy can just get you to be more interested in sports stats than the Bible, he's won. If the, if the enemy can, can get you to become more focused on entertainment than serving, he's won. If the enemy can get you more interested in your own personal pleasures than in what pleases the Lord, he's won, at least in your life. And we can all sit back and we can just say, well, you know what? The Lord is going to bring an end to evil on that final day of judgment. And so I'll just let him deal with it then. I'm just going to go on about my own business. I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry because on the judgment day, God's going to take care of all the evil. He'll bring it to an end. I don't have to do anything about it. What you're failing to recognize is that the Lord wants to give us, the church, the power to prevail over evil here and now. In our lives, in our church, in our community. The Lord wants to give us the power to prevail over evil, evil today. He wants us to prevail over the evil that surrounds us here and now. He wants to give us the power to prevail over the evil temptations that would seek to lead us back into sinful bondage. He wants to give us the power to prevail over those temptations that would draw us away from his presence. He wants to give us the power to prevail over evil right now. That being the case, I want to remind you that God will give you the power to prevail over evil by filling your heart with the faith to believe that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And so let's walk by that faith so that we can have the power to prevail. Not only that, but God will also give us the power to prevail over evil by guarding our steps as we walk in his will. And so let's walk in his will so that our steps will be guarded. God will give you the power to prevail over evil by delivering your life from the sinful schemes of the evil one. If we would simply just ask him, Lord, deliver me from the evil one. And so let's pray. And let's ask him for the power to prevail. In conclusion, if the thought of taking a stand against the evils that fill your heart with fear, if, if the thought of that fight just makes you want to run away. And I just want to remind you, Christian, that according to Paul, we are more 
than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Christian, you're, you're not a loser. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus because God is the one who gives us the power to prevail over evil. 